Hey you, Bravo's now in Canada. I just got chills. If you know Bravo, I love that. I love love that. that. You love that. You know. Vanderpump Rules. Why does it have to get so complicated? Summer House. Don't activate me because you've not seen me activated. Below Deck. I'm not your friend. I'm your captain. Top Chef. Hi, Chef. And Housewives. <gasps> Definitely Housewives. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to this. Bravo. Now available. This is safe. Subscribe now with your TV service provider. Fall in Canada has never been hotter. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter. Podcasts that resonate. Maybe it's just me, but nothing beats a good art heist. A million-dollar painting snatched from behind a high-tech museum security system. A priceless statue vanished from a curator's locked vault. A home invasion that's not about cash or cars, but about a vase sitting in the lounge. Sign me up for all of those. But now... It's time for one of our own, in the heart of one of the most famous buildings in Canada's capital. It involves a famous portrait of one of the world's most famous leaders, Canada's most famous photographer, and a months-long search just to figure out what took place and when. This is the story of how the roaring lion was lost and then found again. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Brett Popplewell is an award-winning reporter and associate professor of journalism at Carleton University and the author of Outsider, An Old Man, A Mountain, and the Search for a Hidden Past. Hi, Brett. Thank you so much for having me. Why don't you start um, by just telling us, I'm, I'm not familiar with this world. I bet a lot of our listeners are not as well. Who is Yusef Karsh? Yusef Karsh was probably the most important portrait photographer of the 20th century. He was an Armenian refugee who came to Canada shortly after the Armenian genocide, and he settled in Quebec. He trained as a photographer in Sherbrooke, Quebec, before going on to do apprenticeship work in Boston, and then situated himself in Ottawa, of all places. And he he set himself up in Ottawa because he believed that if he parked himself here in this city, that he would have access to traveling dignitaries who were coming from overseas to go to Washington and then would make their way up to Ottawa, and he would photograph them. For a long time, he was doing passport photography of regular residents of Ottawa from a studio down on Spark Street. But by the late 30s, he started to get commissions from some of Canada's biggest magazines at the time, Saturday Night Magazine and Maclean's Magazine, to photograph those dignitaries who came, came to the city. So he captured FDR, he captured the king and queen uh, consort from the UK, and in uh, 1941, he captured this iconic photograph, the Roaring Lion, which is the, you know, if you picture Winston Churchill you are probably picturing him in this photograph that was shot on a winter's night in, uh, in Ottawa in 1941. And then he went on to photograph basically everybody of cultural significance, celebrities and world leaders for the next 40, 50 years. And he lived in the Chateau Laurier. Right. And that's important to this story. But first, I want to ask you a little bit more about the Roaring Lion. It is the iconic portrait. Maybe if you could... Uh, describe it, but also you reported some of the backstory, I guess, around uh, how it was taken. So the Roaring Lion is taken, uh, it's in late December 1941. It's a couple weeks after Pearl Harbor. Churchill is a desperate man at this point. Britain's been at war, uh, standing alone in Europe for a year ever since the fall of France. And they're just getting pulverized by the Luftwaffe. And all of a sudden, there's the attack on Pearl Harbor, and there's this opportunity for Churchill to get reinforcements into Britain and into into Europe. Uh, And so he comes here to talk in Washington, and then he comes to, to Ottawa. And he meets this man who is kind of set up in the House of Commons, in the Speaker's chamber, with his camera, and he's all ready to go. But Churchill doesn't know that he's going to be photographed. Mackenzie King and Yusef Karsh at this point were acquaintances. Karsh had photographed Mackenzie King, and and they had this rapport. And Mackenzie King kind of helped to orchestrate this moment. Churchill walks in 
to the speaker's chamber and Karsh, this young photographer, is all set up and Churchill immediately wants nothing to do with him. But Karsh convinces him to give him a couple moments of his time. He places him in front of this, this wood paneled wall and he gets his camera set up and then he realizes that Churchill in this moment is smoking a cigar and he doesn't want Churchill smoking the cigar in the photograph. So he asks Churchill to remove the cigar. Churchill refuses. So the photographer brazenly yanks the cigar out of Churchill's mouth and then bolts back to his camera and snaps this photo of Churchill like scowling at him and looking aggrieved and kind of angry. That photograph becomes this portrait of like defiance. The portrait is called the Roaring Lion because that's what Churchill looks like in it. The backstory is, you know, he's he's upset because he's lost his cigar, but it serves as this propaganda tool to like to rally people behind this kind of bulldog image of the British prime minister at the time who is a wartime leader. And Karsh, as you mentioned, is at the Chateau Laurier, um, which is also, I guess, where your story begins. Can you explain his connection to the hotel and uh, his legacy that that's still hanging on the walls? Yeah, of course. So the Chateau Laurier is, uh, it's a hotel like no other in the city of Ottawa. It's its the closest thing Ottawa really has to a castle. I mean, it's a chateau-esque style. It's this massive building. its It has more than 400 hotel rooms in it, and it, it's situated right next to Parliament Hill. At the time of the Churchill portrait, Karsh was working in a small studio on Spark Street, and living in a house on the Rideau River, sort of out of town. But as his career progresses, and he becomes this sort of traveling photographer who goes to Hollywood, goes to Washington, goes to New York, goes all over the world to photograph, like, if you name any celebrity from, you know, the mid-century, there's probably a photograph taken by Karsh. Right. In the early 70s, he sets up his studio, he moves his studio from Spark Street into the Chateau Laurier on the sixth floor. And a few years later, he ultimately moves himself, his wife and his poodle, onto the third floor. And he lives in this historic hotel for almost two decades. The hotel has this mystique and charm to it. He was using it as a backdrop for a lot of his photographs because he loved the archways and the lighting. And he was really a master of lighting. When Karsh died in the early 2000s, I think he died in 2002, The Economist did a obituary of him, and they referred to him as being like the photographic equivalent of Rembrandt, that his photos really captured that sort of old-fashioned kind of court painter. The old court painters would paint the king. And and the comparison was that Karsh was kind of doing that with his photographs. And so through his career in the Chateau, he really sort of embodies this sort of persona that he that he's taken on. He's a very eccentric man. He's an artist like no other photographer sort of was at that time. One other interesting thing here is like there's there's the collection that he left to the Chateau Laurier, but he left his archive to the people of Canada. You know, on behalf of the walrus, myself and a photographer, we went into this state-of-the-art facility in Gatineau, Quebec, where hundreds of thousands of his negatives and portraits are kept secure in these vaults, including the negative to the Roaring Lion, which during his lifetime, he kept in a bank vault in Ottawa. He really was like a special person in this city. Ottawa is a town that, you know, there are some celebrities that have come from here. There's there's Alanis Morissette, there's Paul Anka, and then there's Yusef Karsh, and he's right up there with the rest of them. And he left, as you mentioned, a number of his, his works uh, at the hotel, which is where I guess the really fascinating part of this starts. So who's Bruno Lair and uh, what did he discover, I guess, in August of 2022? Okay, so in August 2022, Bruno Lair, who is the head of engineering basically at the hotel, you know, it sounds like a Star Trek title, but it's it's really sort of his, his role at the, at the Chateau. He's walking through the reading lounge, which is this oak paneled room that's very close to the lobby of the hotel. And he sees this copy of the Roaring Lion. I say copy, but it's a signed print that was developed by Karsh up on the sixth floor when he was still residing in the chateau. Karsh had gifted it uh, along with a selection of other portraits that he had taken throughout his career of sort of Einstein and Hemingway and Georgia O'Keeffe. 
He had gifted these to the hotel when he moved out of the hotel near the end of his life. He spent his last few years of his life actually down in Boston. He had given these portraits to the hotel and they were on permanent loan from his estate. And the idea was that they would always be bolted to the walls of the hotel in perpetuity for Canadians to appreciate and enjoy and for him to say thank you to the hotel. Bruno Lair, as the head of engineering, was the person who 25 years earlier had locked these portraits to the wall. And then in August 2022, he's walking through that foyer and he notices that one of the portraits, the portrait of the Churchill, is hanging crooked on the wall. And he realizes kind of slowly and, and too late that it's dangling because it's not the real one. It's a forgery that's been put in place of the real one that someone had stolen. It just happened that the discovery in August 2022 was actually about eight months past when it was stolen. I want you to zoom out for me a bit here and tell me about how the world of art theft works in general. Like, why does somebody steal that portrait in particular? What do you do with it once you have it? Yeah, that is the trick to art heist as I understand them. And I spoke to multiple experts in the field who have told me that really art theft has gone down in recent years, that for a long time, these kinds of heists were being carried out by organized crime, by the mafia and, and other organized bodies who would steal them and then essentially launder them, move them along in whichever way they can. It is incredibly difficult, though, to keep these things under the radar unless you have them hidden up in your attic or something. So oftentimes these kinds of cases go unsolved for a generation because it's not until the thief dies or until they think that the trail has gone cold enough that they can come out and try and sell this thing. Other times, they pop up really, really quickly. In the case of the Roaring Lion, one thing that I struggled with off the bat with this story is how a photograph even has any value. Right, because you can reprint it as many times as you want. It is a reproduction. The negative is the original. It has value because of the artistry that went into, you know, the developing of it. It's done in a, in a dark room. It's not a digital photograph. There are touch-ups to it that are done by hand. It's developed using a formula that Karsh concocted himself. It's got a lot of personal touches to it. And of course, he signed it. The providence of it is that it's done through his dark room. So it's still like unique. It's just not totally unique kind of thing. Yeah, it's unique, but it's not one of a kind. Right. The one of a kind nature of this story is that this is the one that he left with the shadow. It's like the one that he left to hang in his old home. Hey, you. Bravo's now in Canada. I just got chills. If you know Bravo. I love that. I love that. You love that. You know. Vanderpump Rules. Why does it have to get so complicated? Summer House. Don't activate me because you've not seen me activated. Below Deck. I'm not your friend. I'm your captain. Top Chef. Hi, Chef. And Housewives. <laughs> Definitely Housewives. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to this. Bravo. Now available. Insane. Subscribe now with your TV service provider. Fall in Canada has never been hotter. So it takes them eight months until they realize that the current one is a forgery and the original has been stolen. Immediately, I guess they call the police. Like what happens over the ensuing few weeks once it comes out that like somebody's made off with the Roaring Lion? As soon as Bruno Lair and Geneviève Dumas, who's the, the manager of the hotel, as soon as they realized that there was a forgery hanging on the wall, they called the police. They called the Ottawa police. But the Ottawa police did not show up for a week. And when they did come, they started questioning the hotel staff as if the hotel staff had stolen it. In fact, Bruno became one of the prime suspects. He was the one who locked it to the wall. He was the one who discovered that it had been stolen eight months later. The other thing is that the evidence, the hotel staff, Bruno and Geneviève, they had dismantled the forgery, to take it out of the frame. So here you have the only evidence that's left by the thief. You know, it has their fingerprints all over it. When I first reached out to Geneviève and Bruno and was speaking to people at the hotel and started reporting on this, they were not overly pleased with how the police were handling the case. They weren't certain that anybody from the police were really following this. And so I reached out to the Ottawa cops and they, they wouldn't talk to me. 
So then I started reaching out to other experts in the field. And I ended up talking to this man in Philadelphia, this former FBI agent who spent 20 years chasing these kinds of things. And he explained to me, he gave me, I think my favorite quote in the story. He said, it doesn't matter if it's a Monet or a Chevrolet, it's property crime. Hmm. And that helped me to sort of understand how the cops treat this. It's just, it's just stolen property, or at least that's how I thought they were treating it. It turned out it was a rather active investigation for a very long time. So yeah, say a little bit more, if you could, about the way police were handling the case. The detective, Detective Akiva Geller with the Ottawa police, who was tasked with trying to retrieve this thing, he insists that he always saw this as something that was important to him, even though it, it appeared that it took him a week to even show up at the hotel to, to investigate. Because Geneviève Dumas didn't think that she was getting anywhere on this, she put out a call to the public that if anybody has taken a photograph of the Roaring Lion in this hotel over the course of uh, the last umpteen months, please send us your photos so that we can try and figure out when this was stolen. The hotel's own social media account had a photograph that they sent out on December 25th, 2021. Now remember, this is like right when Omicron is hitting hitting the country and everything's shutting down. That hotel was essentially empty. Right. They put out this photograph and it's the last known photograph of the real portrait hanging there. And then it turned out that one member of the public who had been at the hotel over the course of that time and taken his own photograph of it was the CBC's Paul Hunter, the, the Washington correspondent who was in Ottawa covering a show for the CBC and happened to take a photograph of this on January 6th, 2022. And so the police had narrowed the window that the portrait had been stolen between Christmas Day and January 6th. So it's an 11-day window. So then they were able to go back and figure out who's staying at the hotel, who's working in the hotel at that time, and, and, and follow up on leads. It turns out the alleged thief um, was neither an employee nor a guest. It was someone who appears to have just come in off the street and stolen this. You mentioned that, you know, once the investigation got underway, the police were extremely tight-lipped about what they were actually doing. What do we know now about the intervening time between when they identified, you know, the window in which it had been taken and when it was announced, I guess, that this photo had been found halfway across the world? So what we know now is that the photograph found its way to London, to the Sotheby's auction house in May 2022. It was in a catalog that was being advertised with photographs from Andy Warhol and others. On May 19th, 2022, it was sold by the Sotheby's auction house. And a man from Italy, a lawyer, rather nice guy, innocent man who I've spoken to, was fascinated by it, saw its value, and won the auction without having to spend a tremendous amount of money. In the end, this thing kind of sold for the same price of a used Chevrolet. Which is how much? How much does used Chevy go for? <laughs> this one sold for, uh, when you do the conversion, it was about $7,500 for the portrait itself. And then the fees connected with the auction, it was less than $10,000 Canadian, which is a steal. What do we imagine, uh, or what do art experts, I guess, imagine the true value of that portrait is? It's a question that I posed countless times. And the easy answer is, oh, it's priceless. Right. That's how people get out of it. But it was once upon a time insured for $25,000. I know that in 1998, I believe, when it was gifted to the hotel, the collection that was being gifted was valued at 50000 US. And the Churchill is the most valuable of all the prints. They have sold for $85,000 and upwards of that kind of amount. This one, when I looked at the, the records of what had been sold, it was cheaper than most original copies of The Roaring Lion. Usually when you think art theft, you think like paintings that go for millions of dollars on the black market or something, right? And not to say that I'm out here buying ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 photographs, but like this isn't a huge score for a thief. Yeah, I mean, in retrospect, it probably wasn't worth it, right? I would not be surprised if the resale value plays into the ultimate trial here. It's hard to say that this was priceless and therefore throw the book at the thief when it didn't carry out to be priceless. What happened to the portrait in Italy? It's an ill-gotten gain in one sense, but also this fellow paid totally 
innocently and paid good money for it. This is part of the story that I found really fascinating. So the man who bought it in Italy is a lawyer. And as such, he knew that there was nothing in Italian law that would say that he had to give it back. He purchased it in good faith. It was his. It it belonged to him. He could have made this very difficult for the hotel to get back. He chose not to. When he started reading all the stories about what had been lost and the, you know, how badly the hotel actually wanted it back. And and Geneviève Dumas, like this was one of her main focuses. Like she kept a folder on her desk with tips on where this might be. Anything that anybody said, she kept it. And she was actively trying to keep this story alive because she believed that the only way for them to get it back was to keep it under a spotlight. Otherwise, it would just be sold and lost. So the guy in Italy, Nicola Casanelli is his name. Ultimately, he was taken by that story, by the narrative of the loss here in Canada and decided to give it back. So he buys it in May 2022. It arrives in the mail in what he describes as essentially an Ikea-like frame. So it had been reframed into something cheap. He then takes it and hangs it in his living room, in a corner of his living room, and admires it for the next five months until all of a sudden he gets an outreach from Sotheby's asking him to please not resell or move it along anywhere else because it might be stolen. That is in October 2022. And he then is kind of put on on alert that this might be stolen. But he's also told that there's no real hard evidence to indicate that this is the stolen the stolen portrait. So for the next year, he doesn't really know what to believe. He just goes on admiring it hanging in his in his living room until November 2023, when the auction house reaches back out and asks his permission to share his details with the police. So what happens at that point when the police reach out and say, yeah, we've determined this is the one? Um, What's the process? The process that even leads up to the Ottawa police reaching out to the buyer involves the London Metropolitan Police working on the Ottawa police's behalf to get Sotheby's to basically give up the information, both on the buyer and on the seller, so that they can trace it back to Canada. Once they get a hold of the buyer, the Ottawa police... Detective Akiva gets on a call with this Italian lawyer, and the lawyer is, I, my, as I understood it, he's he's still not a hundred percent convinced that this is the stolen portrait. He wants, you know, to know for sure, and the Ottawa police officer tells him to take a look at the signature, at the Karsh signature on the portrait, because this portrait had a unique signature in that. Karsh generally (laughs) signed his portraits using a wooden stylus and Indian ink, this like white ink that kind of looks like whiteout on his portraits. Mm. And in this particular one, he kind of started to slant his his name downwards near the end. And the police officer, Detective Geller, was asking the buyer to inspect the signature to see if it had that feature. And of course it did. Then they discussed the dimensions of it, the timeline, and The Italian buyer then takes a little bit of time to think this through and then ultimately goes to his local police detachment to say, I understand myself to be in possession of stolen property. And that's how this moves forward. And he's then kind enough uh, to voluntarily return uh, the portrait to the hotel, which leads to the last part of this, which we haven't discussed yet. And I know uh, there's some secrecy involved here. Who, in the end, is accused of this theft, and will it go to trial, and what might we still learn that police haven't said yet? These are all questions that I wish I could go into great detail on it. What we know is that on April 25th, police executed an arrest on a man named Jeffrey Wood, a 43-year-old, living up around North Bay. That's like 370 kilometers away from Ottawa. We know that he was brought to Ottawa and that the day after his arrest, he appeared in court, that he was charged with six offenses. We also know that he was granted bail and that he's back up in the North Bay area. What we don't know and what we can't yet report is really the details of the investigation because there is a publication ban on it. Now, the big question that I had 
and that I still have as a journalist is how how and why do you arrest this individual in April, but you don't alert the public until September? That is not common. This, this doesn't usually happen. My understanding of it is that the police were struggling to get the portrait back and to make the arrangements to try and help the Roaring Lion navigate its way back through the Italian police uh, to the Canadian embassy and then back into the hands of the hotel. And that's essentially where we are now. So it's hanging in its original place, just uh, locked down even tighter? It will end up back in its original place. The reading lounge at the hotel has been undergoing some renovations over the last few months. I believe the renovations began in May or June. I was there shortly before they began, and they were uh, in full swing when I was there last. That is where the majority of the Karsh portraits hang, because there are other Karsh portraits in the suite that he shared with his wife. There are lots of Karsh portraits in there. But the Roaring Lion will return to that oak-paneled wall in the reading lounge in the not-too-distant future. And we are assured that it will be fastened with a modern lock and there will be increased security on it. There are now cameras on each of those portraits. And at the start of this, there were not. What a happy ending. Brett, thank you so much for sharing this story with us and for tracking this down. It's crazy. Thank you for having me. Brett Popplewell, writing in The Walrus. That was the big story for more from us. You can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always... Send us feedback by writing to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca and by calling us and leaving a voicemail at 416-935-5935. Joe Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is also a producer on this show. Our sound design was done by Matt Kesselman. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our audience development lead. Diana Kay is our business manager. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings, your executive producer and host, telling you to check the feed this weekend for a couple of extra episodes, as well as a special episode on Monday. And we'll talk then. Hey you, Bravo's now in Canada. I just got chills. If you know Bravo. I love that. I love that. You love that. You know. Vanderpump Rules. Why does it have to get so complicated? Summer House. Don't activate me because you've not seen me activated. Below Deck. I'm not your friend. I'm your captain. Top Chef. Hi, Chef. And Housewives. (laughs) Definitely Housewives. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to this. Bravo. Now available. This is insane. Subscribe now with your TV service provider. Fall in Canada has never been hotter.